So this is a good time to do the eye because a lot of the cranial nerves that we've talked about innervate the eye. Um, so there's a lot about a lot more about the eye to talk about. For example, the lacrimal apparatus. The picture on the right is what we looked at when I studied uh, when we studied the, the ocula ocula motor muscles, right? The names and the nerves that innervate them. This one is showing you the lacrimal apparatus of the eye organ. Let's kind of look at that on this slide here. There's a labeled picture there you can look at. Start with associated eye structures for the eye. in this picture, you can point to it, um, in the upper lateral region right here, okay, this part, let's call it lacrimal gland, it is the gland that produces tears, is innervated by cranial nerve 3, okay. When you blink, um, tears are swept from lateral to medial. The medial aspect of the eye, there's a lot of structures you need to identify right here. I'll start with this little bit of flesh called the lacrimal caruncle. Bit of flesh. Now you can see the medial aspect of the eye. It actually ha has a, a glandular function. It secretes kind of an oily substance. It's an oily secretion. So when you go to bed at night, you wake up in the morning, you got that stuff when you rub out of your eyes, the sleep in your eyes. They call it the Sandman's eye. You kind of wash out and you wash your face in the morning. Well, it comes from the lacrimal caruncle. Now, that, when you um, blink and tears are swept from lateral to medial, you have to have a drainage system. So you have this nasal lacrimal duct system. Tears can drain into these little orifices here. They're called superior and inferior puncta. Note that. Superior. inferior puncta. They're just little orifices that lead into those little canals called the superior inferior lacrimal canaliculi. Orifices that drain tears to superior inferior Lacrimal canaliculi. So the structures are the puncta as well as the lacrimal canaliculi, the superior and the inferior. And the picture shows that they drain into the nasal lacrimal sac. So zoom in on it. At the puncta, the canaliculi, shown here. The puncta are these little tiny holes right there and right there. The canaliculi superior, 
inferior draining into this, which is called lacrimal sac. So the sac receives tears. Draining from both of those canaliculi from lacrimal. Canaliculi. It's continuous with the nasal lacrimal duct inferiorly. Basically, the sac is the dilated superior portion of that nasal lacrimal duct. Continuous with. Nasal lacrimal duct. What that duct will do, it'll convey tears to um, the nasal cavity right by inferior nasal conchi. This duct conveys tears from, or excuse me, to nasal cavities by the, well the name of the bone is shown in the picture, inferior nasal concha. So the structure is to know, well, the sac, okay, it's, a the, it's the dilated portion um, of nasal lacrimal duct, but it's receiving tears from those canaliculi. That duct is going to drain tears to the nasal cavities. If you have excess tear production, that's why you have the sniffles, and those nasal cavities are right by the inferior nasal concha, it's on your study list, it's a bone of the skull inside the nose. Okay, so that's basically, basically the tear drainage system. Any questions on that? Basically your tear gland. You have other glands too. That one produces tears. You know your eyelids have glands, um, tarsal glands, so that when you close your eyes, your eyelids don't stick together. So I didn't teach all of them, but lacrimal gland you should know. Lacrimal gland. Let's talk about what are called the eyeball tunics. This is useful when you do your cow eyeball dissection on Monday. Um, this simple schematic just shows you that basically the eyeball, the wall of the eyeball has layers, okay, called tunics. The eyeball tunics, tunic means layer, like shirt. Fibrous tunic is tough. It is thick and tough, and it basically provides attachments for the extraocular eye muscles. of your eyes and 
You're going to have to cut through it, the scalpel. And you'll see how tough it is. Basically, it includes the sclera and the cornea. The extra ocular eyeball muscles, the part of the fibrous tunic where they attach is the sclera, the so-called whites of your eyes. That's the tough part. The anterior part, which is a window, is your crystal clear cornea, part of the fibrous tunic. <clears throat> clear part is the cornea, the tough white part, not a window, sclera. So distinguish sclera, cornea, helps to study eyeball models to do that. Cornea is the first thing light has to pass through so you can see. But you don't see with your cornea, it's just a window. You see with the photoreceptors that are on the, are on the back of your eyeball, identify that cranial nerve back there. Two, yeah, optic nerve, very good. All right, so that's the fibrous tunic. Um, that middle layer, it's a very darkish layer. It's called the choroid. Choroid. Well, the full name is vascular tunic, but part of it, most of it is the choroid. Choroid means ne dense network. That's where all the blood vessels are. Dark, contains blood vessels. Where do the blood vessels come from in the eyeball? Well, not the front, in the center of the optic nerve there in the back. They come out through there and they disseminate through the eyeball in this layer, this middle layer called the choroid. But also anteriorly, that's where you have the ciliary body, right? As well as the iris. So we have stuff in the front that controls the lens. The ciliary body has ciliary muscle that controls lens. So the body has the muscle. Remember, that's the muscle that helps uh, the lens bulge with cranial nerve three. I already taught that, okay? But also, smooth muscle of iris is in there too. Iris is the colorful part of your eye, considered part of this vascular tunic. Okay. Um, all right, that's it for this tunic. We move on to what's called the neural tunic. This is the important one. It's got your retina with the photoreceptors. So, the neural tunic because the retina, that's the part of your eye that's got those important, as many as three layers of cells which include the, uh, the photoreceptors. I'm going to say neurons, not cells, just to get you tuned in. I want you to think, okay, these are neurons. It's going to convey the sense of vision to the back of my brain. I've got to use optic nerve, too, to get it there. These three layers of nerve, neurons includes photoreceptors. It's one of the layers. photoreceptor because those are the rods and cones are your photoreceptors photo because they absorb photons of light take a physics class you learn about the physics of light waves photons of light so you can see in the visual spectrum well anyways neural tunic there's some structures here I'm going to zoom in back of your eyeball 
you get the cow eye on Monday, maybe you can remember this, you, you could see the optic arrow in the back of the eyeball. Sometimes they leave a few millimeters so you can see it. I'll just take a metal probe and shove it all the way through and look at it from the inside. That way you can see this part here where the optic nerve comes in and the blood vessels come in. It's called the optic disc. So know the optic disc. That's where cranial nerve 2 is, as well as blood vessels. It's also called the blind spot, right? Because this is where optic uh, nerve, cranial nerve 2 is, but, but not the photoreceptors. There's no photoreceptors in this area, which is why it's called the blind spot. No, no toe. Right next to the blind spot is actually the spot where you see. Okay, it's called phobia. Uh, it's called the whole thing is called macula lutea. Basically, a term that means yellow spot. A 1.5 um, millimeter little dot dot right in the middle of macula is the fovea centralis. So it's like you have a dot within a dot. Can't zoom in anymore. I don't have yellow, but if you have a whole yellow spot, macula lutea. A little dot in the center of that is the fovea, centralis. This is where you have the highest concentration of cones. The fovea. Sometimes people just call it fovea, that's okay. Fovea centralis is the full name. Highest concentration of cones. Cones are uh, basically what you see when you turn the lights on. You see bright colors, you see in color, you see things with sharpness and acuity if you've got your glasses on, in my case. Uh, so cones are for um, color vision. With sharp acuity, you see details. That's the cone. Yeah. See, so the, the concentration of cones decrease with respect to if you have a macular degenerative disease. Uh, oh, okay. I, I don't know if they decrease the number of cones or they're, they're not functioning. I'll have to look that up. Okay. So, when you turn the lights off but the room is kind of dimly lit like in a movie theater, can you still see? Yeah. Um, when the room is dark, you can still see some things. For dim vision, those are for the rods. Put those in parentheses for now. Dim light. Rods are for when the, there's not a lot of light. Rods are more sensitive, so they don't need as much photons of light to stimulate them so you can see. You can see in a dark room. Not that it's completely dark. Okay. Let me try some. I'm going to turn the lights off. 
when the lights are off, except for the computer, I don't see as much color. I'm looking out at you. Why? Because the lights aren't on. But I can see something. I can see grays. I can see shapes. Okay? So rods aren't for color vision. They're, they kind of turn on better when the room's uh, really dim. Now, if there's complete absence of light, which is almost impossible to do, then you wouldn't see anything. No photoreceptors would be stimulated, even the less sensitive rods. Okay, so anyways, <clears throat> but when you look at something, you look at it. Like, you don't look at someone with your peripheral vision, do you? You look at someone head on, and when you do that, you're focusing that person, that object on phobia. Okay. <coughs> So know that, let me see what else is in here. So the retina includes phobia, macula vitia, let's move on. Here's a picture of when you go to the ophthalmologist and they scan your retina. Turn the lights off so you can see the detail. Sorry, they switch the lights on me. I keep turning the wrong ones off. You see that bright spot, the optic disc, your blind spot? Um, see how the blood vessels emerge from there? So it's brighter because there's less blood vessels there where there's no blood vessels coming out. That's why it's brighter. It's darker here. The dark spot is the macula vitia. And uh, this is kind of a normal looking retina. Your eye doctor can tell if there's some abnormalities. I don't see the phobia in there. Is it in there? Yeah, it, it, it's like pointing right on it. Yeah. In a cross-sectional view, you could actually see it divot. I don't know about the picture of that. But I should include that later on. Yeah, I'll show that to you later. Yeah, um, as, as part of this retinal scan, they'll also be able to see the three layers of cells. And you could see the phobia on that cross-sectional view. Okay, but looking at it like this, you're basically looking at the back of the eyeball. Okay, and they have machines that can scan it really quick. Um, or your eye doctor can like give you those annoying eye drops that dilate your uh, eye, and you have to walk around those funky sunglasses because your your things are dilated. It's really annoying. To prove that you have a blind spot, this test is always given, and I just want, I don't want to just try to do it now. But if you print this out and look at the cross, and then kind of move it back and forth with one eye closed, right? Because if you have both eyes open, you have no blind spot because the other eye compensates. This spot should disappear. Okay, uh, and it's like, where did it go? It's just that the light coming from the black dot is shining on your blind spot where there are no photoreceptors, just to prove you have a bit of a blind spot. It only works if one eye is closed. Okay. All right, so. More anatomy of the eyeball, the chambers, and the conjunctiva, as well as the cavities. If you just look at the cross section of the eyeball, um, well, one thing you'll do is you'll take your eyeball and you'll just cut and you just pop the top off. And you should see some jelly inside called the vitreous humor. The eyeball is not a solid ball, it's filled with humors. So the eyeball can be divided with respect to the lens. Behind the lens is the posterior cavity. The cavity posterior to the lens. It's filled with that. Vitreous humor. 
So when we get our cow eyeballs, I'm going to have you identify that. And just kind of spill it out in a little puddle somewhere on your dissection tray. Point to it later when I come around to check you off. Yeah, there it is. Some of you, it'll be more like a gelatin blob. Some of you will just be like a spilled, melted puddle. Doesn't matter. Just know that that fluid, you're gonna have to identify the little puddle of fluid for me. Uh, be careful how you cut. I don't want anyone to get squirted. You know what I mean? This stuff squirts if you puncture it the wrong way. And, you know, I, I've seen that happen. Okay. And also, when you get your eyeball, it's not gonna be a smooth, gleaming, white, round ball. You're not gonna recognize it. When they take these from the slaughterhouse, those guys, they, they don't pay attention to what you have to do. They're just gonna give you the whole thing with extra ocular eye muscles and fat and connective tissue, and you're gonna be like, that's an eye? Where is it? Make it look like one. Remove the extra ocular eye muscles, get it nice, round, and smooth, then cut it open. We have to do okay. that. It's called a dissection. <laughs> <laughs> so, the answer being yes. You're going to get the eyelids too, cow eyelashes. You're going to see it all. Yeah. Yeah, making this one nice. Okay, anyways. Posterior cavity, posterior to the lens. Anterior to the lens is the anterior cavity. for Monday. Not only are you doing eye, what else are we doing? Brain. Brain. Eye and brain, fun organ day. Be dressed fun for organ day. be dressed for dissection. The anterior cavity is basically anterior to the lens. Now in the anterior cavity there is an aqueous humor that circulates. humor circulates. The anterior cavity is divided into an anterior and posterior chamber within the anterior cavity, okay, with respect to the iris. So within the anterior cavity there is anterior chamber. Basically, looking at using this picture, the anterior chamber is between the cornea and the iris. There's the iris. The pupil is the hole in the iris, but the iris is right there. Basically, that's the anterior chamber. Space between. Iris, cornea. So within the anterior cavity, the posterior chamber is the space between lens and iris. And that humor has to circulate from um, where it's generated from the body, ciliary body, has got to flow and it has to drain. If, if there's improper drainage for whatever reason, I'm not going to really teach that, it can kind of increase the pressure and it, that pressure exerted to the back of the eyeball can cause glaucoma, which is a retinal blindness because of the lack of regular circulation. You can look at that on your own now. I'm not going to test you on glaucoma though, but just to emphasize the circulation of the aqueous humor is important. You can have irregularities in it. Uh, all right, so those are the chambers and then the cavities. The conjunctiva can be seen if we look at a picture of the eye orbit with the eyelids on it. Eyelids and conjunctiva. The eyelids 
cover with skin. They, they obviously protect your eyes, right, when you close your eyelids, okay? Very sensitive. Okay. Um, well, anyways, on the inside of the eyelid, there's a there's a membrane called the conjunctiva. Customer is asked, this is where you get pink eye. Um, if this membrane gets infected, you get a lot of pussy secretion. That, that's commonly known as pink eye. It's highly contagious. It's infection of this membrane. This lining here, but see how it kind of folds right there? They call it a fornix. A fornix is a recess. This is where you put your contact lens in this fornix. If you don't keep your contacts clean, you can kind of get some protein deposits in your little conjunctiva there that your eye doctor can look for during your checkup. Um, I just stopped wearing them because I'm too lazy to put them on. But that's the space for your contact lens and the conjunctiva. Here's a picture side by side so you can see eyelids on and eyelids off the eyeball. Okay, <clears throat> Same picture. I want to talk about the, the photoreceptor. Uh, show you a picture of that. And if you zoom in on this, they're there. They show it to you. The three layers of cells I'm going to teach you are right here. There's one row right there, second row, third row. And that third row has actually fibers that comprise cranial nerve two, optic nerve. I want to talk about just that inner row, the photoreceptors. There's a close-up picture there. So no, notice that when light shines through your lens and focuses on your retina, the pathway of light is to the right. Okay, and it disperses light disperses here on this pigmented layer. The pigmented layer helps absorb the photons of light to reduce the light scattering. And notice that. The photoreceptors, the cones, more rods, the purple, than cones. Okay, cones are for color vision, acuity. Rods, dim light vision. You can't see things clearly because they're on when there's not a lot of light in the room. Um, yeah, they're kind of head stuck in the sand kind of thing where <clears throat> they can absorb photons of light. Let's look at the uh, photoreceptors. Okay, there's, there's another picture of them. Here's yet another picture. I like this picture better. The picture on the left is showing you the cones and the rods. Uh, the picture on the right is kind of a schematic showing you the different parts of the cell of the photoreceptor. It's just a cell, just like any other cell you've studied, but this one has special regions or parts. Neurophys instructors at UCLA, his whole life is a photoreceptor. He's a researcher in that. I mean, he wrote, wrote a whole book on neurons, but his specialty is this cell. This picture is from his book. Uh, pay attention to the different regions. That outer segment's important. That has the visual pigment that can absorb the photons of light to allow you to see. So 
an outer segment, whether it be the rod or the cone. Both have an outer segment, right? Contain the visual pigment. You're like, what? What's a pigment? It's a molecule. For what? Vision. The thing that actually absorbs the light photons. That absorb photons of light. To my knowledge, they only sell that has got it, right? So you can see. You can't see with any other part of your body, as far as I know. So that's why these are important. Now, that inner segment is your basic, where you got the basic cell organelles. You know, right, in, right in here, or here. I got a nucleus, got an ER, got mitochondria, stuff like that. Cell. Then you have a synaptic terminal. That sounds familiar. You guys know what a synaptic terminal terminal is. <coughs> if that thing is communicating with the cell next to it in the retina, it's usually an inhibitory signal. Do you remember IPSP, EPSP in a previous lecture? Yes. Kind of yes. Look it up. This is an inhibitory signal. Okay. Inhibitory means if you're secreting an inhibitory signal on the cell next to you, that cell is off. Okay. Inhibition. <clears throat> well, anyways, let's talk about this thing called phototransduction in the outer segment. This is the thing that allows this cell to like allow us to see. And that visual pigment is, well, the detection of light by the eye is possible because of a photopigment called rhodopsin. That's the visual pigment shown in the picture there. Rhodopsin. If you're like, uh, I'm just gonna learn one day, one word today. Make this the word, rhodopsin. The visual pigment that allows you to see, that, that's good for one day. You know the rest by the test. <laughs> Rhodopsin is the visual pigment. It has a protein part called opsin, the dumbbell shaped thing. here. I don't have purple. Okay, that dumbbell looking thing. Now, that skeleton key looking thing in the middle, that's, that's retinal. That, that's the chromophore that absorbs the photons of light directly. It's kind of like a bent skeleton key. Retinal. Okay, but that's it, that's the visual pigment. The chromophore, right now, absorbs the photons of light. Now in your rods and cones, you have different forms of, well, let me read it from the slide. You have blue cones, green cones, red cones, um, for your color vision, right? But you also have, have it in rods as well. So what you're looking at here is, well, which photons of light can it bind? Visible light, you learn the electromagnetic spectrum in, in chemistry. Just to remind you, the visual light spectrum, the spectrum of EM waves we can see, is only from 400 to 700 nanometers in that wave range. In the electromagnetic spectrum, Visible light is 
is only within the range 400 to 700 nanometers. That's the wavelength, okay, within the spectrum. Like, for example, infrared, microwaves, radio waves, outside the visible light spectrum. Can't see those waves. Shorter waves, like x-rays, penetrate biological tissues so we can see your bones. Those are higher energy waves. Can't see that either. Okay. You can only see the visible light. So 400 to 700. And what you're learning here is, I don't really test you on these numbers, but the, the blue cones have a visual pigment that peaks out. Peak absorbance is within this range here in the blue purplish. Uh, rods, about 500 nanometers. Green cones, 530. Red cones really absorb in the green here, but they're the only ones that kind of go all the way out to the red. So that's why the cones have the, the blue, green, red cones based on the visual pigment and where it can absorb photons of light within 400 to 700. <coughs> Now there are genetic problems where <clears throat> you might have a visual pigment that's defective or missing. And it's known to be an X-linked condition causing color blindness. Blindness is X-linked. Now, for those of you that don't know, um, the human genome, you, you got 23 pairs of chromosomes in each cell that has all the genes of the human genome, which is known now. Okay, They finished it in transcribing the, the human genome in the early 2000s when I was a grad student. Of those 23 pairs of chromosomes, only one pair are called the sex chromosomes that determine gender. If you're a male, your genotype is XY. If you're a female, it's XX. <clears throat> if you're a female, you inherited an X chromosome from your father. And as well as your mother. Your mother only had an X to give you. Um, so you have two copies, right? Because you got one from mom and one from dad. That's how you inherited your genes. That's your inheritance. Your mom and your dad. And, you know, people know this, but in terms of this lecture, if you're a male, huh, that means you got the Y chromosome from who? Papa. Papa. Yeah. Because do females have a Y? No, X, Y. So, okay, so that's inheritance. Now, if you're a colorblind male, it's X-linked. Colorblindness is X-linked. So if you're a male and you're colorblind, you only got one X. So if on that gene, the locus of that gene, the for the red or the green code, it's either missing or deficient for whatever reason. <clears throat> so that's why red is afflicted. You have... Um, that gene is not working or is defective. Okay, so in this lineage, if they have kids, okay, um, if this man has a son, how come they, they don't have colorblindness? What is he given to his sons? He's given the Y, but what is colorblindness? X linked. So he's given the Y. They're okay. He has a daughter. Why is she a carrier? She got the X from dad. Now she's a carrier, she's gonna be okay because he probably got a good uh, X from mom, so she's not colorblind, she's a carrier. Okay, now if, she, if um, let's say, I'm sorry, if she has kids, okay, so grandkids of these guys, she's a carrier, okay. Um, she's XX. <coughs> She 
has one X to give to her kids. It's a 50-50 shot whether she gives the X that's okay or the X that has the deficient or missing, missing code. So if she has girls, what are the chances that her girls will be a carrier? 50-50. What are the chances her, her son is colorblind? 50-50. Okay, because she has one good gene, one bad gene. And that's basically the, the genetics there. Okay. Um, colorblindness, there's some pictures in your book, like, for example, you can test yourself right now. A person with normal color vision, the picture on the left, sees the number seven. Okay? If you're colorblind, maybe you don't see a number at all. Um, for the one on um, the right, red-green colorblindness, people with red-green colorblindness see, see a three or nothing. If you have normal vision, you see an eight. On the left, you see a seven. On the right, you should see an eight. Okay, if you're colored by, you might see a three or nothing. Now, the, the physiology of um, the photoreceptors, they use a, a rod as an example. And this is kind of the physiology of, of the phys photoreceptor I want you to know. So let me kind of outline it for you. So think neurons. I'll help you get you through this. When you're in the dark, literally the room is dark and there's not a lot of light, what usually works is like the, the rods because it's like they're not as sensitive so um, there's, they, they require, oh, I'm sorry, they're more, they're more sensitive, so it takes less light to turn them on. They're in the dark. So, rods are good for dim light vision. There's, there's some light in the room, just enough to trigger um, these cells to turn on. What happens is there's these cyclic GMP gated channel, uh, channels that open that allow this dark current. It's a current that's on when you're in the dark. Okay, it's kind of counterintuitive. No dark current. Note the channel that opens. Cyclic GMP gated channels open, they allow cation influx. So it's a current created by cyclic GMP channels. They're open. Allow cation flow. That cation flow is the dark current. Okay, now what that does is it depolarizes the cell a little bit. Cells usually rest at negative 70 millivolts, but this depolarizes the cell to plus 40. I'm sorry, negative 40. Get that slide there. There it is. Let me just pull back out. So the dark <coughs> current, so that you depol cell to not minus 70, minus 40. Okay, that's the result of the dark current. What happens is that depolarization will trigger the synaptic terminal to fire neurotransmitters onto the bipolar cell due to this depolarization. Causes neuro Yeah. yeah. 
when a cell is depolarized, it'll release neurotransmitters, basically. What I'm trying to say. Uh, now that neurotransmitter release are IPSPs. Okay, those are inhibitory. So basically, you turn off the bipolar cell because you're inhibiting the cell. Those IPSPs. Turn off my polar cell. So because you're in the dark, no signal is sent. Okay? You turn off the bipolar cell, the cell is attached to called a ganglion cell. The ganglion cell is directly hooked up to cranial nerve 2. You're not going to excite the ganglion cell. That's off. So you don't see. Why? Because you're in the dark. It's dark. Ganglion cell off. Don't see. Can't see. Or I guess can't see is. I don't know. Can't. Don't. You're you're in the dark. So it starts with a current that allows you to be in the dark. Basically, the dark current is a depolarization, but the depolarization causes a stimulus of IPSPs, so that the two cells after it, the bipolar cell. It's, and then the ganglion cell off and off. No ash potentials in cranial nerve 2 for that little field of vision, whatever that cell is responsible for. So then turn the lights on. close the cyclic GMP channels, basically you eliminate dark current. In the light, close cyclic GMP channels. Shut off dark current. result of that, you hyperpolarize back to negative 70. So, that cell is now hyperpolarized. It's not going to release neurotransmitter. Okay? No IPSPs. It's not on. Negative 70 is basically our, you know, our resting membrane potential, right? Mm -hmm. So, if you stop the IPSPs, that's basically letting the, turning on the bipolar cell. It's the reverse of before. Bipolar cell now being on will release EPSPs on the ganglion cell. And that'll fire, okay? And you'll actually see the light, so to speak. Turn on bipolar cell, release EPSPs. Those EPSPs turn on ganglion cell, so you have action potentials in the optic nerve. Turn on ganglion cell. So we have APs in optic nerve, cranial nerve 2.
So that's two situations of physiology in the dark and the light. I wanted to show you this picture because it shows you the three layers of cells you're responsible to know. The photoreceptor, the bipolar cell in the middle, and the ganglion cell. And if you kind of like do a close-up of that. You can see that the ganglion cell layer, those axon fibers, are actually what comprise cranial nerve 2. See these fibers there? If they have action potential, that's cranial nerve 2, the sense of vision. The photoreceptors are here. These are the bipolar cells in the middle. So once these are inhibited, uh, they're hyperpolarized, you, s you basically stop the IPSPs. Turn these on, turn these on, so you can see after you turn on the lights. That information is conveyed all the way back to the occipital lobe. Here's the physiology of the, uh, the visual pigment rhodopsin. Okay, let's take some time to look at this. Because remember, what triggered it was that dark current, if it's there or not. See that? Pay attention to the cyclic GMP channels in this figure. process is called phototransduction, where you have the visual pigment absorbing photons of light. When that happens, that bent skeleton key, the chromophore, which was bent, absorb photons of light, it becomes straightened out. That's shown on the figure there. Let me show you. It goes from bent to straight. it activates uh, transducin. Transducin moves, and transducin moves to activate a phosphodiesterase. Activates transducin. to activate a phosphodiesterase. Okay, but that's the machine. That molecule, the phosphodiesterase, <laughs> it will convert cyclic GMP into GMP. You're getting rid of your second messenger, basically. So basically, it converts cyclic GMP to GMP. You're eliminating cyclic GMP. <coughs> cyclic GMP was the second messenger that opened the channels for the dark current. Okay? You close the dark channels, you can see. Um, I'm sorry, you close the channel, you, you eliminate dark current so you can see. Open, close. <coughs> So it's all about that transducent. When it's there, it's like it gets rid of the dark current so you can see. So transducent is important in phototransduction. I named the process for that. And um, so there's something called light dark adaptation. When you're in a light room, then you go to a dark room, or vice versa. And um, what we say is that the cone cells are less sensitive, the rod cells are more sensitive, meaning that the cone cells only work when 
where there's plenty of light in the room. It takes more light to turn them on or to get them to work for us because they're less sensitive. But the cones are for dim vision because they're more sensitive. They don't need as much light to get them to work for us. So when you move from dark to light, like you go see a matinee in the theater and it's all dark, you're set up for dim light vision. But then you walk out of the movie theater in the bright sunshiny day and you kind of have that glare because you're set up for dim light vision for the cones. The, the cones are like sensitive. So when you flash a bright light on it, it kind of blinds you for a second. Okay, You're basically overstimulating the rods and cones. You bleach out. Okay, You disassociate the chromophore from the opposite. Right? And you're kind of blinded for a second and, and you adjust. And um, it takes about 60 seconds, right? Basically, you're waiting for the chromophore to get back with the opposite, okay? So the compensation is to turn off the rods. So this is for light, ad light, ad light adaptation. You're moving from a dark room to bright light. You kind of have to make some switches here. So the compensation is turn rods off because they're more for dim light vision. So I break this down arrow because transducent, it kind of it kind of leaves and moves to the inner segment. So for rods. It leaves. Okay, so, so that way, you know, let's see. If transducent is there, you get this. You get rid of the dark current, but um, if you get that dark current, you're going to like inhibit everything. You're so bad. So basically, Without transducing, you're going to have that dark current. So that's what you want to happen when you go from dark to bright light. Transducing leaves, you're going to get the dark current. Basically, what I'm trying to say here, in a bright light, don't use the rods. This is, I'm not using rods. You're using cones. For this situation. So then the reverse is true. Let's go through that. Dark adaptation is you move from light to dark. You're outside. It's Right day, you go into a very dark house. And you can't see. Everything's like a velvet, velvety, velvet darkness, velvety blackness is what I say. What you want to do? Don't use the cones. Use the rods <laughs> for a dark room. So, so in the dark, I'll just say don't use cones. So what happens is, um, for the rods, turn those on, um, the transducing returns. Okay. Eliminate dark current. So 
So that way you're using your rods for the dim light vision. Whatever little light is in the room, they'll work so you can see in the dim light. I'm just writing use rods for dim light vision. So going back to what I started with, um, you, you, I learned, you learned, I taught, optic nerve, optic track. Okay. So what I want you to learn is that, go back and look at those notes, that the optic nerve carries information from left and right visual fields in either eye. Okay, and that's why I kind of have yellow and blue. Yellow and blue. Uh, a question that we commonly ask is, well, what happens if you have an injury or lesion on a nerve or a tract. See where I have the red line? Let's say, for whatever reason, you're blind in this eye, that you lose information from right and left visual fields in the left eye. However, you retain left and right uh, visual fields for the other optic nerve. If you want to know what that's like, just close one eye. And just wear, wear an eye patch all day see what that's really like. Uh, what's more unusual is if you get a head injury where you don't damage the optic nerve, you damage an optic track, where you lose the visual field in both eyes. Okay. Well, the eyes aren't working, it's just the optic track is damaged. So you just lose information from right or left visual fields. In this example, um, the right visual field because the left optic tract is damaged. Now this one, I, I don't know what it's like, and I can't have you imagine it. Um, it's like if you, to, on one side of the room, it's completely blacked out, but you can't do that. If you close one eye, you, you can still see over there with this eyeball. So, uh, that one I can't really describe what it's like. I just don't know. Does anyone know? Okay, that's good, probably. You don't know. When you do your cow eye dissection next week, I took a picture of like one of the best ones. The student like was very organized. They put everything out. Oh wow, look at that. I can see everything. Look at the blob. Vitreous humor. Okay. See all the um it's kind of like a a brownish color retina. Mm-hmm. Oh, Sorry. Yeah, that's front. That's front. Let's put front of the body. Students have trouble finding the retina. Let me point this out to you. See how it's kind of brown and it's dark? The dark is the choroid. Okay, but see how the outer rim is white? That's sclera, choroid, and that kind of brownish thing. See how it's kind of like it lines the inside? You could sweep it off easily. That's the retina. And students forget to do that. So right there where it looks like it's emerging through, that's the optic disc. That's the cornea. What do you think that is? Lens. It's kind of real, real hard in your cow eyeball. All, the, all, all, all that's the stuff you had to dissect off, all the fat and extra ocular muscles and other connective tissues, eyelids, all that stuff. What's the whole pupil? And what you should do when you have this is try, try to figure out the iris and the ciliary body. Okay, this will be uh, for Monday. For this one, it's hard to see. See that little black dot? That's phobia. Usually you can't find it. And I let you get away with not finding it. it. It's hard to see. But this is a good example of macula latina with phobia right in the middle. Okay. Well, anyways, that's uh, for Monday. For now, um, I want to like shift gears a little bit. I want to um, take roll and I want to make some announcements about the end of the class, make sure we're all on the same page. Because when we get to the end, I want there to be no mistake. <laughs> Sona? Yes. Did you say Sona? Irina? Yes. Amy? Artemis? Neil? Neil Cruz? Dave? 
Leah Fott, Brittany, Mark, Mark Harrell, Yester, Edgar, Patricia, Victoria, Brianna, um, Yana, Maya, Vita, Obey, Jennifer, Haley, Maria, Romania, Ulysses, Janice Segura, Christina, yes. Suhair, Siraj, Suhair, Austin, Here. Sylvia, yeah. Olga, yeah. Francis, Cole Williams, Let's see Christy, Joe, Ahmad Zaki, and Ahmad Zubair. Okay. All right, so yeah, most of you are here. Okay, that's cool. Um, so, my plans for uh, this week, let me turn the 